and uh, cultivating a love and delight for God's word series. And uh, I jumped ahead uh, a few sections in Psalm 119, so we're in uh, verses 65 to 72. And then uh, I actually have a slide that kind of uh, has topics of all of the other sections uh, that I skipped. <coughs> Let's see here. Oh, all right. I, I was searching for uh, some kind of humorous, uh, you know, slide. And this morning I found a number, a bunch of things that my kids like. Uh, but uh, this one kind of spoke to me because this, this, is, this is me. This is something I literally would have done uh, and probably have thought of doing. How many of you uh, have difficulty shopping for a Christmas gift for your wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, over the years I have done some doozies that weren't very good. And uh, well, this, is, this is something I, you know, probably would have done. Yeah, so your standard man at this point in the Christmas season has purchased zero gifts. He had, so my wife's purchasing gifts for, you know, family and different people. And, uh, and uh, the whole time I'm thinking for like the last two months, what am I getting? And I haven't decided. <laughs> and oftentimes it turns out to, uh, I, at the last minute I get something and it's bad. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so the next one. He did give her something last year, but he could tell by her reaction to it that she had not been dreaming of getting an auto emergency kit, <laughs> even though it was a deluxe model with booster cables and an air compressor. Wow, that would have been nice. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? Well, he's thinking about her safety on the road and all uh, this, but it's like maybe she was thinking about maybe something else as, you know, maybe a romantic gift of some kind or, yeah. Uh, so clearly this gift violated an important rule, but the man had no idea what that rule was. His wife was too upset to tell him. So, <laughs> so yeah, I've gotten, like, uh, gifts for my wife in the past. And, uh, like, one time I, I got her a steam cleaner for cleaning the stove and for cleaning, uh, you know, different things. It's a little a portable, uh, so it would help make cleaning around the house easier. And uh, so in my mind, I thought this was a wonderful gift. And she uh, did not take it that way. And uh, so about three years ago, I gave her a gift that I was going to paint. Notice I said was going to paint the entire kitchen cabinets and give her a nice fret and the inside of all the cabinets because that's what she wanted. About three years ago, and I'm still not done with it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so... Uh, and that, that, was a, that was a gift. So <clears throat> this year we're, we're splurging. We're getting a, a whole new uh, bathroom uh, tub surround and everything. And uh, that's, that's a big amount of money. It's a family gift. Uh, but uh, we've also spent way too much already on other things. <clears throat> that's one of the things that gets me down sometimes. You're like spending so much around the holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I did a summarizing uh, topics of some of these session, sections. That, well, uh, I, I preached on these first two. Um, uh, God's word blesses the faithful, and uh, God's word can keep my life clean. I did that la last time. And then these are some of the other ones. God's word guides me through life. God's word revives and strengthens me. God's word guides me from futility to life. God's word brings liberty or freedom, and God's word comforts and strengthens. God's word compels and keeps me, and then this brings us to today. God's word teaches the benefits of affliction. It's like, well, why are you preaching on affliction? <laughs> There's just, uh, this one kind of stood out to me, I don't know. Uh, Holy Spirit kind of leads sometimes, and it's like, this is one I was going to do. I may at some point go back and do some of these. I don't know yet, but I'm going to move through. Uh, I thought this was uh, pretty good. There's a, uh, there's a, um, uh, what's it? It's a, uh, a commentary on Psalm 119 on blue Bible, blueletterbible.org. And it's pretty good. 
And uh, there's, there's other ones that have summaries of all the different sections in Psalm 119 as well. That's where I got these. Oh, also, had, no, also I liked it because I had the, the Hebrew letters listed. This is the outline. Did you get a handout? Okay. I didn't know if John got them. I sent him an, an email, and then, uh, good. So, Psalm 119, and verses 65 through 66. Says, I got four of them, and then there's two verses in each, which is kind of good. God's teaching is requested. So David, uh, the, uh, the psalmist writing, talks about wanting more teaching from God. God's goodness during affliction, in affliction, 67, 68. And then number three is delight in, God's, in, delight in God regardless. Delight in God's word, delight in God regardless. <clears throat> And then the fourth section in there, value learning God's word. 71 and 72. So, we're going to, okay, now we're going to read the, the scripture. This is a section, uh, Tet, of the Hebrew alphabet. And each verse in the Hebrew language of these eight uh, verses, the first letter, all starts with the, each word starts with the letter tet in the Hebrew alphabet. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, okay, what is he saying? It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And the last, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I apologize for the smaller font. I was trying to fit it on one slide, but it's, it's all there. So, so now we're going to go to the, f the first section. Oh, yeah, some, some facts about this text. I already mentioned a little bit. Each of these eight verses begins with the Hebrew letter Tet. And the most prominent word in, in these eight verses is the word good. In Hebrew, that's uh, tov. And uh, it's used six times in, in eight verses. And it's interesting because the word good starts with the letter tet. So in the Hebrew, if you look at the actual text, it'll have that good out in the front uh, in many of these verses. And this tov good is used over 500 times throughout the entire Bible. The psalmist, is interesting, believed to be David, equates afflictions with good. You know, I don't often think about afflictions as being something good. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, in here, he chose to share some of his experiences of, of, of affliction and put it in the good passage uh, of, the, uh, of the psalm. I thought that was kind of interesting facts about that. So here, number one point, uh, God's teaching is requested. Put the verses there. And I didn't write the verse numbers in front. I kind of have them at the top. You have dealt well with your servant. That word well is, is the Hebrew word good in Hebrew. O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. So David's thanking God for doing good to him in his life. And he says, you have dealt well with your servant. He's recognizing that God's involvement, his experiences, um, although he may have gone through some uh, time of affliction, he, he realizes that God was doing this according to his word and that God is dealing well with him, dealing good with him. 
Understanding God's dealings with him uh, were faithful to his word. He understood that what God was doing in his life is, is good because he's being faithful to what the scripture says. As far as God's character, David asked to be taught good judgment and knowledge. So teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. That's a good thing to do. We should always ask God to, you know, to teach us to, Teach us knowledge. There's scripture that talks about anyone who lacks wisdom, you know, that, and to pray for it. Uh, there's, there's numbers of, 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 of scripture passages that, that ask us to, uh, to call out to God for understanding and wisdom, knowledge, and really this good judgment in the Hebrew literally is taste. Oftentimes you'll see, uh, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So this taste is a, a discernment that you can uh, tell whether something is, is good or not good. Bad, you know. Oftentimes Mary has me taste the, the milk. <laughs> has it gone bad? <laughs> or something else. Uh, and it's like, de- depending on my taste, <clears throat> And there's other things. You know, that's taste. Taste is relative to some people. Some things might taste good to some people and not good to other people. But here, it's speaking about good taste. Taste that God approves of. So it's discernment as well. Knowledge and discernment can help you avoid the pitfalls in life. So we should be praying for that because we don't want to trip and fall in life and end up in difficult situations and circumstances, all because we were just too stupid to, uh, to you know, think ahead and pray about it and that God is, uh, God could be there to, to aid us through these things in life. David believed in God's word that it is good. He says, I believe in your commandments. And so, uh, he understood that in God's word and in, in, in the scriptures, there was good and then he could learn from it and uh, improve the quality of life. Think of how God has dealt with you in your life. Did I say dealt with you? How God has dealt well with you or dealt good in your life. So I got on this uh, commentary, I was going to read this. I didn't want to put all this out on the slide, but... We don't think about it enough, but it is wonderfully true that you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord. Think of all the ways that God has dealt well with us. He loves us. He chose us. He called us. He drew us to himself. He rescued us. He declared us righteous. He forgave us. He put his spirit in us. He adopted us into his family. He makes us kings and priests and co-workers with him and he rewards all our work for him. You know, God deals with us in ways that help us uh, come on board with the things that he's doing. And really what it all comes down to is I need to step back and allow God. If, if I impose and tell God, this is what I want you to do in my life, this is what I want to participate, this is what I don't want to, uh, things become difficult with our relationship with God. We need to allow God and the Holy Spirit to work in us uh, unhampered. Or... Anyway, so in uh, James 1, 5, we got a couple of cross-references. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Mary often tells me, have you, have you asked God for you know, she, she'll quote some. <laughs> that's what a wife is for, right? To help us, you know. Uh, you, you need to have, you know, and your spouse and encourage you. Uh, so James 1.5. And then Philippians 1.9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. There he lists both of those words that is out in the psalm. Knowledge and discernment. And we need to be praying for that in our, in our life. Uh, it helps us. So the second point, God's goodness in affliction. 
So whenever you're afflicted, like I said earlier, I don't often think about uh, that it's a good thing. The Apostle Paul prayed for his affliction that God would remove from him. And oftentimes that affliction God puts on us is, is there to humble us. It's there to keep us close to him. It's to, to keep us from self-reliance and reliance on God. Uh, God wants us to be dependent on him, but... Uh, God also wants us to, uh, to seek his face all, you know, is, is paramount above all things. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So is that a discipline? <laughs> God disciplined. Uh, so I remember growing up and being whipped by my dad. Uh, he's trying to teach me some lesson. <laughs> anyway, uh, for, because I was wrong and I, I was disobeying and I, I was doing bad, <clears throat> doing poorly. But uh, I don't hear too many uh, kids talk about that today. I hope there's not a whole lot of fathers out there just like beating their kids raw. But I do remember in school, even when I was in elementary school, that the principal was, anyway, there was, I think of that as a little bit abusive. But the scripture does say, spoil or uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. You, you, make sure your rod comes make sure it's, Yeah, yeah. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. So David is understanding God is good and he does good. And God cannot do other than he is. Everything God does is with, in accordance with his word. Life before the affliction, well, he knew that he should live for God, but he lived carelessly. He lived disobediently. He was wandering aimlessly, dabbling in sin some. Uh, really, you know, oftentimes people will wander and backslide, and uh, not our devotion to God just dwindles sometimes uh, based on different life experiences and different events. Some people who go through affliction don't are not really drawn closer to God. Oftentimes they become embittered to God. David didn't. But those are the times that God is disciplining and he wants us to, uh, to realize the lessons and come back to him. One commentary was talking about that this is the time that God is beat. So, so my mother used to do this. Uh, we'd bring the rugs outside and just beat all the dust and dirt out of the rugs. And uh, one commentary said, well, that, that's what this affliction is like. You are the rug, and God is just whipping to get all the dirt and filth out of you. And then when you're all nice and clean, <clears throat> you, uh, you're more, what, more obedient. Your, uh, God can use you better. <clears throat> so now, life after the affliction, you're humbled, obedient, repentant, more steadfast. Eh, I could have gone on with a bunch of things here. But yet... Um, the, the affliction is, is, is a disciplining act, and oftentimes the affliction is, uh, is us realizing that God loves us and God cares, and he wants us to uh, become more and more like him. <clears throat> and he wants us to get rid of the things in our, in our life that are not good, the things that, uh, that uh, fight against Good. Often our trials act as a, this is Charles Spurgeon, a quote, often our trials act as a thorn hedge to keep us in the good pasture. But our prosperity is a gap through which we go astray. Oftentimes when life is uh, easy and you feel, you know, smooth sailing uh, and, and you become more self dependent, more self-reliant, and like things are well off. That's the time when we tend to, uh, to walk away from God. It's, it's often, in, in the Old Testament, uh, David 
And when he was a king, did not go to war, it says in scripture, and he was home, he got tempted by Bathsheba, and a whole bunch of bad stuff happened in his life. <clears throat> Anyhow, but uh, it's, it's those trials that we remember that God has done in the past to help us and to understand uh, uh, where we need to be with him. These, this becomes a hedge of uh, obedience for us to, uh, to keep us in the good. David could have grown bitter, but he knew God meant it for good. Because God is good and God only does good. So David says, teach me more. Teach me to be good as you are good. You are good. So and then I put on here, some commentary says this, that David's gone through some affliction. He says, teach me, and oftentimes God does teach through affliction. So it's kind of like commentary to say, bring on the affliction if, if you have to, because I want to learn about you. I want to learn. And uh, I don't know if I put a comment in there. That, okay, yeah, because of my stubbornness. Oftentimes I can be stubborn. And David uh, had some stubbornness too. God, God works that out. Hebrews twelve eleven. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And uh, so you look forward to the time of disciplining, the time of the affliction to be over. And in the Old Testament, God removed Israel from his nation, from the nation and took them into exile. And a lot of the prophets wrote about this is a time of affliction, this is a time of correcting, a time of disciplining, of, of, uh, of reflecting on, uh, on us as a people, as a nation, to help us get back to God and to move away from our, our wrongdoing. And then Acts 10, 38, B, second part. He, I uh, put Jesus in there. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. <clears throat> I just put that in there because this just shows that he did good things, and we need, to, uh, we need to be doing good things. We are told, Jesus says, uh, that, was it, he, that we are the salt and light of the world, and he tells us that we ought to be uh, doing good to those around us, using the things that God has given us to minister to others and help. God is good, he does good, and he wants us to learn his good ways. Okay, next. Number three, delight in God regardless. This one, is a, this one is a little different section. It doesn't have the word good in these verses. <coughs> the insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. So that, that part is unfeeling like fat. There's different ways of translating that. A lot of scholars are not sure exactly how the proper meaning was meant. However, the word fat is used in Scripture. We know how it's used. Oftentimes it's used for ex extravagant living, for excess. Uh, talk, some commentaries use the words uh, similar to how Jesus shared the prodigal son story when the son went away to a foreign land and he spent all his money in extravagant living that's called fat the fatness of life uh overspending over indulging over eating over you know doing everything too much and uh that fatness uh, causes you to become desensitized not caring and, and a number of things if we expect god to do good we should also be expecting our adversaries to do us evil. Why would we be surprised if those who do not believe in God or who, you know, uh, 
do they, Jesus says people will not like you because of him. If we choose to follow Jesus and be his disciples, Jesus gave us warnings that there will be people out there who will not be happy with you. So not to not be surprised. <clears throat> but here, the insolent are smearing David with lies, trying to discredit him. The arrogant and proud, they're trying to discredit Credit David by fabricating some lies and spreading it around to others. And what does David do? But David chooses to wholeheartedly adhere to God's ways and so discredit those lies, he is drawn even closer to God. How oftentimes uh, people would make fun of you. Like, I remember when I was a Christian in, in high school, college. Uh, but in college, things changed because then I became more of a Christian leader. Uh, but, you know, some people who just don't understand the Bible, don't understand God, they're not believers, and they really think that you're, I don't know, crazy to believe this. And uh, sometimes that can weigh heavy on your shoulders, and you can, you can feel kind of burdened. I remember when I was working uh, at, a, at a factory and there was lots of people around me who just were atheists, they were into drugs, they would be drinking all weekend and Mondays were like the worst. It was, it was an assembly line factory <coughs> and uh, cuts, cussing and swearing all the time all around me. I literally had to every break pull out my New Testament Bible and just load myself up with the word of God because I had to clean my mind from all the filth around me. And I was memorizing scripture just to keep my mind and my spirit uh, protected. But, uh, so their hearts is unfeeling like fat. So the word there talks about being having dull hearts, non-feeling, insensitive full of worldly lusts, not caring about spiritual things, indulging in excess, excess living, excess everything. Uh, but the main issue in there is that they are insensitive and they, are care they do not care. The arrogant and proud are insensitive, indifferent in their hearts to what is right. They do not seem to care. They even find it silly that we care about doing what is right. So this is one of the things that I come across too at work, uh, people. Um, to, you know, they tell me, I, I say, well, that's not the right way to do it. Well, what do you care about the right way? You know, it, it saves us money. Okay. People today are not governed by moral right and wrong. <clears throat> I, I, don't, I don't see it that much uh, because they're only governed by being caught if it's if they do something wrong, they, everything wrong is okay to do unless uh, unless you're caught. Uh, then then you pay whatever <laughs> consequence. Uh, well, that's a little cue for me to share a little bit of my store experiences. But yeah, uh, at, at work I oftentimes have discussions with people like, uh, and I've shared some of this before. Um, that, you know, I, I try to always have a certain quality, a certain level of, uh, it, it, and we talked about this in the men's group, of pride. <laughs> no, there's good pride and there's, you know, not good pride. But I try to, I try to feel that, that what I do, I'm happy with. It makes me happy because if I cheat, a customer, if I cheat my boss, if I cheat something, somebody, I feel miserable. Uh, but most people just don't care, and they think it's okay to do that because it makes your it makes things easier for you. Well, to me, it doesn't. I say, what is what's wrong with going the extra mile? What's wrong with you know doing the extra thing? Uh, I like it when people say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like it when people say thank you. Uh, it's not like I'm trying to do it for their praises. It's just that I think of it as God wants me to do good. God doesn't want me to cheat. 
God doesn't want me to go around and, uh, uh, you know, try to do the least amount just to get by. Although when I was in school, I, I just kind of felt like, you know, if I get a C in my class or, you know, I can do C work, it's okay. Uh, but when I got to college, I didn't feel like that wasn't good. <laughs> so, and then, then David, David says here, but I'm not like them. I'm not like those uh, arrogant and proud, the, those insolence. It says, but I, I delight in you. I don't delight in myself. I don't delight in uh, doing, you know, things that, I don't delight in other people's, but he says, I delight in you. So we're told in scripture, many different places too, to do our work, do everything as if unto the Lord. He's our boss. We should choose to delight in God regardless of what others say or think. Why? Well, it's the right thing to do. And we're, and we're kind of commanded to do so as believers, as, as God's people. So then the last point here, value learning God's word. Oftentimes, uh, devotions or when I, you know, would read the Bible, study the word. Uh, now, when I was in college, it was a little different than I was in seminary. Was, I, the only thing I was doing in seminary is studying the word. Well, no, no, that's not true. I was also studying church history, just different things, but yet um, it was a... I was excited to study certain topics and certain uh, different fields of uh, interest. And oftentimes I felt I had to discipline myself to study God's word, to get into God's word. Uh, and uh, when I was a, when I was, most people can, you know, feel, remember this, when you were a new believer, a new Christian, you had excitement to uh, read the Bible and read as much and learn as much. It's like, fill me up, fill me up. <clears throat> and over time, some of that passion, some of that fire that was in you kind of dwindles. And we, had, we need to constantly rekindle that and come back. And it, really, it's a, it's a battle, but that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be, uh, he wants us to be in his word and closer to him. Some people say, well, I've read the Bible. I've been there. I've done that. Well, God wants us to continue in it. And then he says, there, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Some commentators are saying, well, David had lots of money. <laughs> uh, but David didn't look at it as that he was just com comparing with what he had learned from God during the time of affliction, that to him, he valued that even more so than any riches. So lessons taught, lessons learned. And I wrote, whatever it takes. Oftentimes, teachers, I, I, I had many times, Mary, so <laughs> Michaela was this troubled student uh, when we were growing up in elementary and younger uh, younger grades, a lot of teachers during uh, parent-teacher conferences would ask, how do you get through to your child? <laughs> and uh, so teachers, you know, they want to be able to get through to the kids and really uh, have interaction and see that they're excited to learn. And uh, oftentimes, a lot of kids who uh, just have, uh, what's it called, attention deficit and and all these uh, anxiety and all this uh, hyperactivity. And it's like, you know, everybody has their thing. And oftentimes teachers now have to try all different methods to get to students. It's not like, it's not like you do one teaching method for everybody. It, it doesn't really work uh, so much, you know, everybody's a little different. But it, you know, it's here, it's like whatever it takes. Sometimes God uses affliction and difficulty, suffering, things in life that are just miserable to go through, but oftentimes God uses that to teach, to teach us. And sometimes it takes those things to break through that wall that we have in our hearts and in our minds. David's reflection on his God-ordained affliction he says, it is good. 
It is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? Because it, that's what it took for me to learn. And in the end, everything is way better. And he said he, he wouldn't have traded it for a thousand gold pieces. He was better off for it, having learned what God taught him. That's the goal, really. You know, God wants to teach us. I think oftentimes we need to, have, we need to be teachable. That's the thing we always look for. When you're hiring new people for work or you get, you know, uh, you're looking for people who, who want to learn. A new trade, new skill. Uh, they, 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 want, they have a, an interest to better themselves. If, if everybody thinks, so, oh, well, I know everything. You know, there's nothing you're going to teach me. You know, I'm better than you. Uh, things like this. <clears throat> Those are not the ones you want. Uh, I'm, I've run across people at work oftentimes that are like that. So they've been doing this job for 25 years, and now they're new in this new company. But we do things a little differently. <laughs> it's like, well, they're not going to do it differently. They're going to keep doing the same thing they've always done. It's just human. It's, it's the way things are. God's word is more good to him than much earthly riches have. It says that. I kind of re-hit that. The last slide. Well, I think there's a summary slide. David felt that what he learned of God's word during his affliction was worth more than great riches for us to think about valuing what we learn from God in our time that we spend in uh, personal devotions, time maybe in scripture memory, time in just uh, Bible reading, study, listening to sermon messages, and so forth. We should be investing that in, in, in real, I, you know, just this last week, I was thinking back, when I was growing up in the church, my parents' church, I went to church Sunday morning, oh, yeah, I was in Sunday school, I was also in the choir, so I was literally in church six hours every, maybe seven hours, six hours, maybe every Sunday, and then I came to weekly visitation program, and then uh, Wednesday evening, uh, Bible study. Uh, Sunday night we had discipleship, and Wednesday we had the dinner and Bible study, and I think Wednesday was also choir practice. Uh, and then there was, I think, another visitation on the weekend, and then and then it started all over again. And I'm thinking, holy cow! You know, I go way back and say, I, a lot of my friends would say, oh man, you were in church way too much. Uh, and sometimes I think about, well, my kids are not in church that much. They're not getting as much growing up like I did. And I often uh, feel that <laughs> I, I wish they would have to get that more. Are you spending time in the Bible? Are you seeking the wisdom of God? Some reflection on that. Because I really see that we need to value that more in 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 our lives as believers, as Christians, uh, walking with the Lord, that, you know, that's what we need. I think oftentimes in, wor in the world today, we're distracted by a whole lot of stuff out there. When you do read the Bible, are you actively engaged in it, making the changes in your life that God wants you to do? Are we convicted by things as we read Scripture? God's word has great value. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God for profitable and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God and woman may be complete, equipped for every good work. It's a good verse. And, uh, you know, it tells us about uh, how the Word of God can be used in our life. And the Holy Spirit uses the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit will use it to, uh, to correct us, will, to convict us, to keep us, and to teach us. Okay, last slide. Well, number one, we're going to be seeking from God good judgment and knowledge or wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. No... What God dis know that God disciplines us through the afflict through afflictions and difficulty in life, different circumstances, 
and know that it is good. Delight in God and his word, regardless of what others think of you. Oh, yeah, some, I didn't man- mention this, but some commentaries talk about the affliction. So there's God-ordained affliction, and then there's also affliction that is brought on by just sinful living, making bad choices and decisions in life. And some of those are things that are just the consequences of making poor choices, of lacking good judgment, of lacking wisdom and knowledge. And that's why we need to seek those. <clears throat> so, number four, place a higher value on learning God's word. I think I need to do that in my life. I need to be thinking of that more so, of valuing the word of God uh, more. I know when I was growing up throughout my uh, discipleship years and in college, it was really important to me. And uh, now, you know, I've shared this before a couple messages ago that I, I feel, and one of the reasons I wanted to go through this series a little bit to help, uh, to help myself in the word, uh, to get a better grasp of uh, loving it like I used to. Putting it into practice as life depends on it and not just as a good notion. Oftentimes we'll read the Bible, oh, that's good, that's good. But if you just leave it there, it's like looking at your face in a mirror and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. I had that verse somewhere in a previous message. <laughs> but anyway, so there, there's my... Uh, there's my message on this, uh, this passage. And uh, it was fun working through it. I enjoyed it. And I just pray God's blessing on, on you guys uh, today also. Uh, do we have a song?